Okay, this is a uh, good shot here we can see of uh, the reserve trench, right? So this is the third row, uh, well and behind the, the frontline trenches, but connected to the trench system. And we can tell that that's the case because, uh, well, we see a lot of equipment that is here, right? We see these guys, uh, and these guys here were largely, uh, these would have been sappers, probably engineers. Um, and they would have been sort of the responsible for the construction of um, the trenches and the maintenance of the trenches themselves. But we can see we've got, you know, a lot of handles here that could have been for shovels or for, you know, an axe or something along those lines. Um, and you, you notice these, uh, these metal pieces here that look like a, you know, rather long corkscrew. Um, well, this is what they use to create barbed wire um, barricades with. And you can see that uh, the idea here, obviously, if you're putting up barbed wire, you are uh, at ground level. So you would want to be able to do that very quickly so you wouldn't be shot at. Um, and the idea was that you could twist these into the ground uh, and they would create um, uh, you know, enough tension that you would make a post that you could connect barbed wire um, uh, too. And barbed wire was coiled sort of like a slinky. So uh, the idea would be that you would uh, extend it out like an accordion and just attach it to these uh, corkscrew-like posts. Uh, now, lots of these actually still exist in Europe. Uh, lots of uh, remnants here of these uh, metal pieces um, exist in farmers' fields even to this day. So there's quite a bit of relics that uh, um, still remain in, um, in the Western Front. Um, and then we've got some boxes here and whatever, uh, who knows what's in there, but could be ammunition or whatever else. Uh, this is an interesting shot here of a field hospital. So, of course, because there were many injuries from World War I, you had to have areas where wounded could be tended to. And these were often just in behind the, uh, uh, the lines and, uh, you know, kind of primitive construction. But uh, oftentimes these were probably just makeshift hospitals that would have been in uh, abandoned barns and this would be called a dressing station so uh, for men who had you know superficial wounds so you know you had uh, lesions to the skin um, you know maybe a break of some sort or a sprain an injury that way not a non-threatening non-life-threatening injury you can see this guy here's got a pretty nasty shrapnel wound here a good patch of skin torn off of his uh, arm there so this is where they would do just some simple bandaging um, and you would have doctors here that would be tending to that. Uh, you can tell by this guy's face. This is quite a famous picture, actually. This guy's look and this guy's look that uh, may be a little evidence of some shell shock here as well. And beyond this, so, so in the back area here, we would have what would have been the operating room. All right now, obviously, this would have been for men that had more severe injuries, life-threatening injuries that would need immediate attention. Um, and you could see the tables themselves, quite a few doctors here. Um, tables that men would be laid upon, um, and quite oftentimes they would be strapped down. You could see that uh, actually right here, this doctor is getting prepared to strap down this man's legs. Uh, now, the reason for that is uh, because the number one surgical procedure performed in World War I, more often than anything else, was that of amputation. All right, these doctors had a mandate to save lives. And they were not interested in saving limbs. So if an injury was severe enough that the doctor, um, you know, felt that uh, a limb needed to be amputated to save the man's life, uh, then that's exactly what they did. Uh, and keep in mind that they had, uh, you know, you could be, uh, as a doctor, bombarded here with hundreds of men needing uh, immediate attention. So you had to act quickly. So the decision was very s straightforward. If you had a severe injury, oftentimes it meant that you were going to lose a limb of some sort. Um, now, this process itself was uh, quite, uh, quite gruesome um, because they didn't have, you know, time for anesthesia. Oftentimes they would give the man you know, maybe a, a couple of ounces of rum and, uh, you know, something to bite down on. And that was it. And they would use hand saws uh, and they would literally just uh, saw away at limbs and then try to cauterize and sew up the wounds. Um, and there's a picture we can see here of a man getting prepped for that sort of surgery. And you can tell by the look on this guy's face, he's just horrified with what he's watching. This guy here would likely have been a chaplain, and there were many thousands of chaplains that went along to provide comfort for men. Um, and knowing that most Canadians were Christians, they would uh, offer that in this time.